<laughs> okay. I guess I'll start. Um, I'm Kenny, doing the CCM lecture. Start. There we go. Uh, we're sorry for a case. Patient was found lying down in the subway platform, rolling around, possible seizures witnessed by bystanders. Cold and responsive only to painful stimuli. These are initial assessments. Airways intact. Breathing is intact. Uh, she's bradycardic. There, she's a little agitated. There's a gaze preference and she's soaking wet. These are initial triage vitals. Uh, heart rate's at 34 and everything else seems okay. Uh, glucose is 115. For the temperature is not available. Per the triage nurse note, it says, unable to obtain during triage stroke code was activated. Patient was tra transferred to CT. Per the resident though, uh, they had tried multiple times to get a temperature and could not get one. So preliminary problem list, I'm supposed to ask a junior to identify some problems. Anyone? Perfect. Uh, and then there's this gaze deviation and she's cold. Uh, so the initial event inter interventions, a stroke code is called from triage, uh, cardiac monitors put on. She got eight of Versed, IM, uh, and she got peripheral access and EKG was done. So this is just rehashing the HPI from the resident note. In terms of the physical exam, she was agitated, combative, disheveled. Uh, no respiratory distress, lungs were clear, she was bradycardic. She's obese, there's some excoriations on her abdomen. She's cool, edematous. There's a right gaze deviation. She's responsive to painful stimuli. And then within the differential, uh, I guess I'm supposed to ask the resident again, but um, I'll just present the, uh, this full di uh, differential. Uh, it's pretty widespread. Um, there's a lot of stuff that could, could go wrong. Uh, Neurowise, there could be um, some kind of bleed uh, status. Uh, Cardiovascular-wise, she could have a braided dysarrhythmia, AV block. There could be some hormonal issues going on, there could be sepsis, environmental issues, uh, or exposure, and uh, toxic slash metabolic abnormalities. Her CT head was unremarkable for any acute things. And then in terms of reassessment, uh, the gaze deviation uh, and agitation resolved with the verse said, and you can see her rectal temp was 76 degrees Fahrenheit or 24.4 degrees Celsius. Uh, CTA was deferred because she was bradycardic. Uh, this is the EKG. And sorry, I'm supposed to ask another junior to <laughs> interpret this or anyone. All right, we see some Osborne waves. Anything else? She's bradycardic. Prolonged QT. Prolonged QT, correct. Prolonged based on rate Yeah, that's still. Um, yeah, everything is essentially prolonged. PR intervals are prolonged. QTC is prolonged. Uh, you might also notice that she has a little bit of shivering going on here. All right, in terms of the ED course, um, within half an hour of coming in, heat packs were on her. She's, uh, she got a warm blanket and bear huggers applied. She got uh, O2 humidified air through uh, high flow nasal cannula. And then the level one was used to give her two liters of LR warmed. And then per the resident, although it wasn't documented, um, pacer pads are placed as well. <clears throat> These are the labs we got, basically your basic ones, uh, trope, uh, thyroid studies, uh, utox, and then infectious workup, and then an uh, ICU console was placed. Uh, these are results. Uh, I'm just going to skip the asking a junior to interpret again. Uh, essentially, you can see that there's a little bit of uh, respiratory acidosis going on with uh, hypercapnia, and then her potassium is a little low. Uh, the shock also had a, a high bicarb, which we weren't sure what. It came from. 
Um, these are the blood results. Uh, nothing too abnormal. And then her uh, ethanol was negative, thyrostase were normal, trope was negative, CK was uh, slightly elevated to a four, uh, UA is negative, and her COVID was negative. Uh, this is her chest x ray. The resident read said no focal consolidations, she's rotated. And the attending read read diffuse reticular opacities in the right lung, obscuring the vessels, uh, suggestive of pulmonary edema. So in terms of the updated problem list, we have severe hypothermia from the rectal temp and uh, hypercapnic respiratory failure. In terms of the rest of the ED course, uh, a Solex catheter is placed at nine. Dopamine was started. Uh, per the Mickey attending wrote, uh, note, it was for bradycardia and hypotension. Yeah, I get the side effect of tachycardia if you want. But it's yeah, still not the final answer here. CBI was uh, uh, performed through Foley with uh, warm fluids. Uh, these are the recs from uh, the ICU. Really nothing to add except for uh, uh, antibiotics. And then a neurocritical care console was placed. Uh, they said it was likely due to this. The, her ultimate metastasis was likely due to hypothermia. Uh, they do an EEG and start in Capra. Cool, so this is my talk uh, on accidental hypothermia. Uh, you essentially, this essentially occurs from an unanticipated primary cold exposure. Uh, we'll touch on secondary hypothermia causes, but it won't be the focus of this talk. Um, but with that in mind, you wanna just keep your differential wide. There could be reasons why the patient's cold. There could be reasons why the patient uh, is incapacitated to, to leave the cold too. All right, so in terms of definitions of hypothermia, there's two methods for staging. Uh, there's a traditional mild, moderate, severe, uh, based on the core temperature. And there's a Swiss clinical staging, uh, which correlates to just the uh, clinical symptoms. So stage one, you're shivering. Stage two, you're altered. You're not shivering. Stage three, you're unconscious. And stage four, you're cardiac arrest. Uh, keep in mind that this is all a spectrum. Your temperatures and clinical picture might not align. And some background information, there's about 1,500 documented hypothermia-related deaths yearly. Uh, this is very likely underreported. Estimates are as high as 25,000. If you want to compare this to uh, excessive heat deaths, it's uh, 400 per year for the CDC. Most deaths are seen in males. Highest instances are in urban settings, so the highest prevalence are in rural areas. And risk factors include the elderly, alcoholism, mental illness, and homelessness. In pathophys, uh, we all learned this in physics um, in terms of heat loss. Uh, most accidental hypothermias are due to convective heat loss through the cold air and then conductive heat loss. Uh, we have direct contact with water, melted snow and cold surfaces. Uh, your body reacts to this by first peripherally vasoconstricting. Um, this basically shunts uh, uh, blood back to the core to keep uh, the core warm. Uh, and then your hypothalamus senses uh, the cold, compares it to our general set point, which is about 37 degrees Celsius. It triggers shivering uh, to create heat um, and then increases metabolic demand. Your stress hormones also go up, your thyroid, fun or thyroid hormones, catecholamines, adrenal activity. So these are all normal responses to stage one hypothermia or mild hypothermia. EKG changes. Uh, in mild hypothermia, typically there aren't any EKG changes. You might see some shivering. Uh, when you go into moderate, you start seeing your bradyarrhythmias, uh, AFib with slow ventricular response, um, sinus brady, junctional, slow junctional rhythms. And then once you start heading to severe, you get into V-fibs, uh, VTAX, and asystole. Uh, everything essentially slows down. You have your prolonged PR. Uh, QRS, QTCs, you might start getting into AV blocks first to third. And then J waves are typically seen uh, around less than 32 degrees Celsius. The J point is the junction of your QRS and ST segment. And the J wave itself is the uh, positive deflection there. Uh, it's mostly seen in the precordial leads. 
V2, V6. Um, and the size of the J wave is actually inversely related to your core temperature. So as you get colder, the wave actually should get bigger. Uh, this is not pathognomonic to hypothermia. You can find it in other things like uh, increased intracranial hypertension uh, from hemorrhage, uh, cardiac ischemia, myocarditis, brugatus, hypercalcemia. It could also be a normal variant. Uh, and just keep in mind that hypothermia uh, can actually obscure hyperkalemia findings on EKG, most commonly the uh, peak T waves. Uh, so this is another example of another CCT patient seen, I think, just a few days after our patient. Um, again, you can see the Osborne waves, uh, bradycardia, shivering artifacts, prolonged QTC. Uh, just in terms of more complications, as you start going into stage two hypothermia, uh, cardiovascular-wise, uh, as I mentioned, you have an increased risk of uh, VFib, VTAC, uh, cardiac arrest below 32 degrees. Um, Respiratory-wise, your uh, respiratory drive decreases. You can have hypoventilation. Uh, and then you also have pulmonary edema from depressed cardiac output. <clears throat> Neuro-wise, you get CNS depression. Uh, your hypothalamus stops working around 30 or 32 degrees Celsius. You stop shivering, your stress hormones go down. Uh, there's something called paradoxical undressing uh, where somebody takes off their clothes uh, when it gets cold enough. Um, it's thought that this is because they're dropping catecholamines. You don't have this peripheral vasoconstriction going on anymore. So all your core heat goes to the surface and you feel warm. Uh, it's associated with about 20 to 50% of all deaths. Uh, renal wise, you get cold diuresis. This is thought uh, to be in part because your hypothalamus stops working and you stop secreting ADH. Uh, you can also get AKI from the diuresis and rhabdo uh, just from your frozen extremities um, caused by lysis of uh, muscle cells. Uh, electrolyte abnormalities, initially you get hypokalemia, um, late stage hypothermia, you get hyperkalemia. And then heme-wise, you get um, coagulopathies. Uh, just of note, coagulopathies, a lot of times when we get our coags from hypothermic patients, they're normal. Uh, those labs are actually taken to the lab and actually reheated to 37 degrees Celsius. Um, so it doesn't really capture uh, sort of this in vivo coagulopathy. Uh, and I just want to talk about two phenomena that people talk about a lot. This is core afterdrop. Um, it's a phenomenon that uh, mentions that as you warm up the extremities, uh, the core temperature continues to drop. Uh, and this is kind of cited as a reason not to rewarm somebody, uh, especially in the field. The thought process is that you have vasodilation as you warm somebody, it sends cooler acidemic blood back to the core and it causes shock and arrhythmias. Uh, there's a lot of papers out there now that are just debunking this is not a real phenomenon, saying that it's just poor temperature measurement. They're using rectal temps instead of uh, a better core temp uh, through the uh, ET tube. Uh, and then there's a bunch of physiologic experiments done that haven't demonstrated this to be the case. AKA just rewarm somebody. Uh, another phenomenon is called rescue collapse. Um, it's just clinical worsening during rescue or after rescue before you warm somebody. Um, it's associated with transport, movement, vertical positioning, procedures. The thought process is, is, is that when you change their positioning, you change the distributions of fluids in the body and you basically stress an already stressed heart. Uh, so the recommendation is to keep patients horizontal. All right, so we'll get into the management. Uh, basically we took this from AHA. Uh, the initial guidelines uh, for their ACLS protocol is um, to do these few things uh, when you first get a patient from the cold. Uh, essentially, you want to remove them from a cold environment, take off the wet clothes, uh, put some blankets on them. And again, don't move them too much. And then in terms of your ABCs, uh, just highlighting the differences, uh, they say to do a pulse check and breathing check uh, for 30 to 45 seconds. Again, uh, you have vasoconstriction, you might not feel the pulse. Uh, 
and they might be uh, hypoventilating, might not notice them actually breathing. You can consider using an ultrasound at this point if it's difficult to palpate a pulse. Uh, another difference is that for uh, VFib and VTAC, when you're thinking about defibrillating, just deliver up to three shocks uh, and then uh, continue warming until 30 to 32 degrees Celsius. Uh, just to go into airway and breathing some more, um, you wanna use heated inspired air. Um, obviously you can do a face mask or high flow for a patient or through the ET tube. Uh, it doesn't really provide too much additional heat, uh, it just prevents further heat loss. Uh, in terms of intubation, uh, for the indications, uh, Dr. Beta actually had a talk last year about uh, the reasons for intubation uh, based on a podcast from uh, Dr. Strayer. He talks about the ABCDEFs of intubation. Uh, airway for A uh, refers to anatomical obstructions. Typically, we don't worry about this too much in hypothermia, um, but we don't know what's going on. Maybe they choked. Um, maybe there's some kind of infection going on in the mouth. B for breathing. This is probably the main reason we intubate. Uh, hypothermia causes respiratory rate to decrease in respiratory rate. C, circulation for cardiac arrest. D for disability. Uh, if somebody has CNS depression, uh, they require airway protection. E for expected course. Uh, for a hypothermic patient, if you're expecting ECMO or a thoracic lavage, you may want to intubate them early. And F for feral uh, for a combative patient. Uh, so if you apply this to our patient, uh, she hits a few of these. Uh, for breathing, she was in hypercapnic respiratory acidosis. For D, uh, she was altered for disability. And then F, feral, she was combative. Um, so you could consider actually intubating the patient that we saw. Uh, you can consider using uh, rocaronium. Uh, as I mentioned, late hypothermia, you can get hyperkalemia. So you want to avoid using a depolarizing paralytic. Uh, trismus is a rare complication, um, but it can happen in, in case your, your jaw essentially gets uh, frozen shut. So uh, prepare to intubate nasally and get your cry kit ready. And don't delay intubation. Uh, there's also, as I mentioned, this rescue, no, rescue collapse. If you do some procedure, there's a risk that if you intubate somebody, they might go into VFib. But uh, there have been a number of studies, uh, prospective studies too, that didn't show any VFib after nasal or uh, endotracheal intubation. In terms of circulation, uh, so a hypothermic heart often is unresponsible to cardiac drugs, uh, defibrillation, and pacing. Uh, additionally, drug metabolism uh, through the liver is usually reduced. Um, so theoretically, as you're giving medication, it could accumulate to dangerous levels. Uh, both the AHA and the European Resuscitation Council recommends not providing epi until you warm somebody until 30 degrees Celsius. And then the uh, European Resuscitation Council mentioned that they recommend uh, doubling the time interval between your doses until you reach a temperature of 35 degrees. Uh, cardiac pacing usually is not indicated uh, for bradycardia. Uh, usually doesn't persist past rewarming. What's that? Yeah, we'll talk about that. Um, so it might have been preemptive, preemptive uh, to put pads on her, but a good idea. Uh, and then in terms of uh, pressors, uh, there's no guidelines on what pressors to use. Uh, and uh, hypothermia has been found to change the, the way that your receptors respond. Uh, in mild and moderate hypothermia, your alpha and beta receptors are actually a little more sensitive, while in uh, deep hypothermia or severe hypothermia, the receptors are actually depressed. And then uh, some studies have shown that alpha and beta receptors respond differently uh, depending on what temperature they're at. Uh, so really there is no uh, definitive window for when you can use uh, uh, certain pressors, except for dopamine is shown to have a safe profile, but it's only been done on animal models. Uh, I haven't seen anything about the efficacy of this though. And Sinnert's shaking his head. 
Uh, and then in terms of uh, when you're providing CPR and chest compressions, just prepare for a prolonged CPR. Um, the longest CPR duration with no neurologic deficits was three and a half hours. Uh, there's another case where if somebody survived six and a half hours of CPR, um, likely with neuro deficits. Uh, so consider breaking out your Lucas. And just keep in mind that we only have one Lucas in CCT. Uh, so if you're considering transporting to another facility, uh, see if you can ask paramedics to see if they can bring their own. Uh, so just talking more about circulation, you wanna provide warm fluids. The idea is to provide volume uh, and address the cold diuresis. And this also prevents uh, further heat loss. Uh, so you wanna consider NS for volume expansion. Uh, some, uh, some articles were saying to avoid LR, saying that uh, your liver being in a hypothermic state can't metabolize the lactate. Uh, and then always remember there's a risk for worsening your pulmonary edema given the depressed uh, cardiac output. So in CCT, we have three ways to warm uh, fluids. Uh, we have this flat, the fast flow fluid warmer, which we call the level one. Uh, there's five of them available. I think there's another five in storage somewhere and there's one in peds. Uh, and then you adjust the rate based on the pressure you place in the bag. Uh, one thing I didn't know is that we have these uh, hotline warmers. Um, they're not pressurized, so they don't go as fast, but they rewarm just the same. There's three of them in CCT. And then uh, you can use a microwave. Um, so Dr. G talked about this, how uh, he used it back in his practice. Um, typically for a 600 watt microwave, it takes about two minutes to heat up uh, a liter bag. It's about 39 degrees Celsius. Um, but what Dr. G said is you just cut a hole in the bag, put a thermometer in there and you just time it. Um, so if you put two minutes and it's at 38, just consider increasing the, uh, the time for the next uh, bag. After you heat it, just shake it up uh, to remove hot spots. You don't wanna heat up uh, fluids with dextrose in it in the microwave, uh, cause they may, uh, the sugar may actually caramelize at 60 degrees Celsius. Uh, in terms of blood transfusions, it's, you can run these through the warmers uh, up to 43 degrees Celsius without any cl clinically significant uh, amount of hemolysis. Uh, just don't put them in the microwave. Um, you might create some hot spots and it might lyse the uh, hemoglobin. And that was actually an article in Annals of uh, Emergency Medicine. Uh, so this is adage, not dead until warm and dead, which really stresses rewarming as the fundamental thing to do as part of resuscitation. Uh, once you're warm, that's when you bring back your metabolic processes, your cardiac conduction. Um, and it's suggested that you continue resuscitation and CPR until 32 degrees Celsius. Uh, situations where it might be futile is if you have obvious lethal injuries, say you're decapitated or you have truncal transection, if the body's completely frozen and you really just can't push against a frozen chest for compressions. Uh, and then some studies have showed that uh, hyperkalemia is a, a, a marker of poor outcome. Um, some have showed at uh, greater than 10 or 12 millimoles per liter. Uh, none of those studies really uh, had any patients CKD or ESRD uh, and nothing was mentioned about crush injuries or hemolysis. And then for your avalanche victims, uh, if somebody's buried in the snow for 35 minutes and they have a blocked airway, likely it's hypoxia that caused their arrest. Uh, on the other hand, if they're buried for more than 35 minutes and their airway is not blocked, uh, could be that hypothermia is the cause of their arrest and you can continue CPR. Uh, so you wanna move on to your secondary survey. I know there are a lot of words on here. Uh, just quickly run through uh, I mean, this is not, I'm not going to run through all this, but just to let you know that there's a lot of reasons for uh, secondary hypothermia. Uh, and again, reasons why somebody could be down and not be not able to take themselves out of the cold. Uh, these are typical lab findings in hypothermia. A uh, few just to point out, your hematocrit should actually go up uh, because of hemoconcentration from cold diuresis. If it's low, consider a bleed. And then uh, hyperglycemia suggests 
pancreatitis or DKA, you can consider adding a lipase. Uh, but if you want to treat that, insulin is very ineffective below 30 degrees Celsius. And I mentioned uh, about the coags being ran at 37 degrees Celsius, um, but also ABGs and shot um, are run at 37 degrees Celsius. There's no consensus of how to interpret them once they're uh, the, the, the results that you get at 37 degrees Celsius, but consensus is just interpreted as it is. So, uh, in terms of additional treatment, uh, these are uh, conditions where you have high mortality that cause uh, secondary hypothermia. So if adrenal crisis is suspected, you can give uh, hydrocortisone. Uh, if you have a diagnosis uh, of myxedema coma, uh, give synthroid and steroids. And then if you find that you're rewarming the patient, but they're not really warming very fast, um, you can give uh, empiric antibiotics. There's a study done out of Bellevue that suggested that rewarming rates of 0.67 degrees Celsius per hour had a high risk of underlying infection. And then those with uh, rewarming rates of uh, 1.7 degrees uh, have a low risk. All right, so onto the fun stuff. Uh, treating the patient essentially is rewarming the patient. Uh, there were, there's some data out there uh, about um, how to rewarm the rewarming, rewarming rates. Um, there's some retrospective studies out there, but a lot of these were actually just case reports uh, and case studies. Uh, so there's no real RTC, RCT out there that compares one modality versus the other um, and any neurologic outcomes and whatnot. So uh, these are mostly just uh, expert opinions. So treatment is based on what stage of hypothermia you are, uh, you're at. So stage one, uh, you just wanna provide uh, a warm environment, passive external heating. Uh, stage two, you want to go into your active external uh, and warmed IVF. Stage three is that that's when you start considering uh, your more invasive options, including ECMO. And stage four, you're performing CPR. Uh, you're probably doing your both your active and external and active uh, internal warming methods. So the table on the left is just a summary of rewarming rates uh, using different modalities. Uh, we'll start addressing these one by one. And on the right, I uh, just wanna highlight this paper. Um, it's the largest study to date about rewarming rates compared with mortality. It was done out of Japan. Essentially it shows a correlation that slower rewarming rates caused, uh, or not caused, have increased mortality. Uh, so passive external, uh, this is for your mild hypothermia. Uh, basically, you want to allow the body to remorph itself. So you place blankets on a person, you increase the room temperature. Uh, you re really need the patient to have the ability, the physiologic ability to generate their own heat. Um, they have to be shivering, they have to be able to increase their own metabolic rate. So if you have a person that's elderly, malnourished, um, their glycogen storage are uh, depleted. Uh, you probably want to use this, but you want to use another modality as well. Uh, Rewarding rate 0. 0.5 to 2 degrees per hour. Uh, active external. Uh, this is when you're applying exogenous heat externally to rewarm. Uh, so you can use this uh, fairly easily uh, in conjunction with other rewarming methods. Uh, and this increases your core temperature faster than the passive one. Uh, the most common ones that we know about uh, this are the forced air rewarming devices. Um, that those are your bear huggers uh, that we have in the in the uh, ORs. Uh, in the EDs, we have the striker mistral airs. Uh, there's other proprietary systems, um, and they're lumped under external temperature control systems like the Arctic Sun. They use uh, just a fancy temperature monitoring device um, that that heats either uh, pads or gels uh, externally to, uh, to bring somebody up to temperature. Uh, the problem with these, these are pretty expensive. Uh, the cons for these are that uh, there's a potential for burns uh, when your skin is vasoconstricted, when your peripheral vessels are vasoconstricted, you're more susceptible to thermal injuries. Uh, 
active internal. Uh, so this is when you're applying heat internally to rewarm the core directly. Uh, just from a lot of attending feedback, uh, this is very messy. Uh, the methods or the, the, met, uh, the modalities I'm gonna talk about um, essentially in terms of, uh, well, I guess I'll break them down into two categories, lavages and what I call smart systems. Uh, lavages, you're gonna hook up the level one rewarmer to whatever modality it is, and you're gonna uh, heat the fluids to 42 degrees Celsius. Uh, and then your smart systems have a temperature monitoring system. Uh, and also they offer more than just rewarming. So talk about the lavages, gastric lavage. Uh, you're essentially placing an NG tube, OG tube, uh, confirming the placement, and then you're uh, infusing fluids down, uh, allowing the fluids to dwell, and then you remove it. Uh, just to ease it up, you can do a, a Y connector. So you can have uh, fluids going through one port and then uh, suctioning on the other port. Uh, the pros, we know how to put in NG2, so we're very familiar with it. Uh, the cons of this is that uh, regurg is very common, it increases your risk for aspirations. Um, so you generally wanna perform this in patients who are already intubated. Also, the stomach isn't very large, it's a small surface area to exchange heat. Um, and then CPR is not possible with this for risk of aspiration. Uh, there's some case reports about clonic lavage, which uh, nobody really mentioned how to do this or how to perform this, but I'm guessing it's through rectal tube insertion and then you just push fluid through a irrigation port, but I'm guessing nobody's really done it here. It's not very popular, yeah. Um, bladder lavage, uh, it's very common for us to do in CCT. Uh, it's the same as uh, set up as a Foley insertion. You can consider using a triple lumen Foley, which you can get from uh, urology, but it's not necessary. Uh, same as gastric lavage, you infuse fluid in, you let it dwell, and then you drain it. Uh, with a triple lumen, you can have both, again, a, an irrigation bag and a drainage bag. Um, the pros, same as gastric lavage, and then the cons, again, it's very limited surface area, uh, rewarming rate about one to one and a half degrees Celsius per hour. Peritoneal lavage. Uh, so instead of a diagnostic peritoneal lavage, you can call it a therapeutic peritoneal lavage. Um, the catheter that you insert is the same that you do for DPL. Uh, I'm guessing a lot of ER doctors don't do this much anymore. It's been supplant, so supplanted by fast exams, CT scans. Um, but I guess it's still within our scope to do. Uh, the process is that typically you, you select a site that's two centimeters below the umbilicus. You go through uh, three layers, the skin, the fascia, and the parenteal lining to insert your, uh, your needle. Uh, and then it's kind of like a, a central line where you use a Selinger method to uh, introduce the wire. And you pass the catheter through. Uh, you want to infuse about 10 to 20 cc's per kg of warm fluids. Again, let it dwell and then suction it out. Uh, prior to actually putting in the tube, you want to put in a, an OG tube or NG tube and a Foley catheter just to decompress the abdominal cavity. And then there were some suggestions of getting an x-ray prior to this, just so you can rule out diaphragmatic air, sub-diaphragmatic air, because um, you might actually introduce it. Uh, the pros for this is that you're actually hitting up a, a large surface area. There's a theoretical benefit of reviving your liver, uh, which allows it to clear toxins and other metabolic processes. And it allows other metabolic processes to return. Um, and then the idea is that you're, you're essentially giving a little episodes of peritoneal dialysis. The cons of this is it's invasive. You have risk of perforation, uh, risk of infection. Uh, so you may consider a surgery involvement for this just to help out. Uh, the effective rewarming rate is a little higher for this. It's two to four degrees Celsius per hour. Um, so thoracic lavage, in this case, you're directly rewarming the core, the chest, the heart. Um, there's essentially, you call it two types, uh, closed, 
which we're using chest tubes uh, and open, which you do in thoracotomy. So uh, you also have to choose which side of the chest to do. So the thought process is, is if you still have a pulse, you want to avoid the left chest, uh, putting a chest tube in there, flushing it with water, um, cause agitation to the heart, can easily induce arrhythmias, uh, V-fib. But if you're pulseless, you may want to consider using the left chest uh, just because the heart needs rewarming first in order for medications and defibrillation to be effective. The pros for this say, again, you're rewarming the heart directly. Um, you're also rewarming the pleural space, which is highly vascularized. It doesn't require for you to have an intact circulation um, because you're rewarming the core directly. Cons, uh, it's messy, it's invasive. Uh, if you insert a chest tube in the left side with the cell of a pulse, uh, you could induce VF. Uh, you could increase your thoracic hypertension if you don't uh, drain fluid out too much or too fast uh, and risk of infections. Uh, the rate for this is about three to six degrees per hour. So the closed method, uh, you can do the one versus two, two method or and or uh, one chest or two. Uh, if you're doing the two tube method, you wanna put your first chest tube in the second, the third and possible space, mid clavicular. Uh, for the second chest tube, you put it where we normally put chest tubes, the fourth, the sixth intercostal space, mid axillary. Um, and then you infuse your, your uh, warm fluids. Uh, you can, if you're doing the one tube method, uh, you just put it in the posterior, uh, mid axillary line, and then uh, infuse your fluid, clamp it for 15, 20 minutes, let it dwell in there and then uh, drain it. But it's a little more labor intensive. Uh, one suggestion was to, uh, instead of a chest tube for the anterior one, to use a pigtail instead. Uh, it's a little cleaner, it's a little easier to put in. Uh, the hole's not as big. And then if you're not finding that the patient is uh, rewarming as fast as you like, you can consider changing or switching the, uh, the pleurovac, uh, instead of putting it from the posterior to the posterior chest tube, you can put it to the anterior one and then filling it from the posterior uh, chest tube with uh, warm fluids. This way it fills up before it gets drained. But again, you might uh, be increasing the pressure in there too much. Uh, it might cause uh, the lungs to uh, basically collapse. And then uh, open uh, is messy. You're basically doing a left side thoracotomy. Uh, again, this is very dangerous to do uh, if uh, the person actually still has a pulse or perfusing on their own. They're not in cardiac arrest. And also it's pretty dangerous if you don't have uh, uh, ECMO or uh, cardiopulmonary bypass in house, uh, cause this is seen mostly as a uh, temporizing measure until you get to some Get, get somebody to ECMO. Um, obviously you want somebody that's uh, experienced with this to actually lead it. Uh, and you're not able to do CPR here, but uh, you will be doing cardiac massage if they're in cardiac arrest. Uh, and then you can defibrillate through uh, internal defibrillator pads, which I'm not sure if we have in the CCT. Okay. Uh, so for the smart systems, um, so this is what was placed in our patient, uh, uh, rewarming catheter. These are the same catheters you use for uh, TTM, post-cardiac arrest, um, but you're just using a rewarming cycle. Uh, you basically uh, rewarm the blood uh, by, uh, within the catheters, there's a balloon or um, coils that uh, run heated saline through and warm up the blood as it runs through the uh, central line. Uh, the pros for this, we're very familiar with putting in central lines. Uh, you have central uh, line access and you, it's kind of this more of a set and forget it thing where you have a machine that controls your temperature. Uh, you could also maintain your CPR. Uh, the con is that it's very expensive uh, and it hasn't really been shown to be superior to other methods like just putting a bear hugger on and running warm saline. Um, there's a study out of Hennepin that showed a, a rewarming rate of only, only 1.3 degrees per hour. Uh, 
you can consider dialysis, especially in cases of intoxes, uh, electrolyte abnormalities, and if they have an existing access, uh, maybe fistula. Uh, the pro is it's available in house. Uh, you can, like I mentioned, um, correct your electrolytes, your acid base uh, derangements. You can give them fluids. You can also remove drugs and toxin. The cons, uh, it's not readily available per se. Uh, it might just take hours, one, to get uh, renal involved, two, to get staff down there and the machines down there. Um, yeah. So practically, it's probably not so uh, useful at our shops. Uh, and this also requires a, uh, a beating heart. Uh, Rewarming rates about two to three degrees. And then this is the mainstay, this, or sorry, this is like the gold standard for uh, treatment for severe hypothermia, especially in case of cardiac arrest. Um, so uh, usually use it for your uh, stage threes and fours, especially in cardiac arrest. Uh, it's been shown uh, by multiple studies to have both short-term and long-term uh, survival, improved survival. Uh, as well as uh, baseline or near baseline neurologic outcomes. Uh, the pros for this is that it supports your organ perfusion and oxygenation. Uh, it's got a very high rewarming, rewarming rate uh, and allows you to stop CPR. Uh, the cons is not, it's not in house. It's very resource intensive. It requires you to call an ECMO center, call the transfer center, uh, get accepted and for their uh, mobile team to come cannulate and place the patient on ECMO. Uh, and then there's a bleeding risk for a patient who already is coagulopathic. Uh, and these are the local ECMO centers we have. Uh, MIMO uh, is where we usually send patients to for other things. Uh, LIJ has ECMO as well. NYU has ECMO. Uh, and I just found out that Methodist has ECMO. I called their ED and their attending says that uh, best not to send their, them patients because they often send their patients out to Columbia. Uh, and then this is more of a practical slide. Um, so it's to mainly help with lavages uh, where you have to connect the level one infuser uh, warmer uh, to different modalities. So it might require you to jerry-rig a lot of these connections. So the end of the level one is a uh, lure lock, the male end of the lure lock. Um, and then you have to connect this to some kind of receiving end. So I came up with this uh, mnemonic uh, swap because you're swapping fluids from one tube to another. Uh, the easiest way is to, you can screw the lure lock uh, into the female end of the lure lock. You find the female ends on uh, pigtails, DPL catheters, um, and so that's easy. Uh, w is for wedge. Um, you can actually wedge that end into small or slightly larger tubes, um, but not too large, obviously, because you'll have leaks. Uh, it's a lot easier in rubberized tubes like Foley's, um, but in this picture, you have uh, a 36 French chest tube that I wedged the, uh, the line to. Just make sure it's uh, in there deep and then secure it. Uh, a is for adapt. So um, there's different ways to make an adapter. Um, first one is a uh, Christmas tree adapter, which you can find in uh, your chest, your pleurivac kits, uh, where you're bridging a tube, an open tube to an open tube. Uh, the one in the middle uh, is an adapter uh, when you want to connect a male end uh, to tubing. So I took a three cc syringe, cut it with shears and just put it into one of these suction uh, little tubes. So uh, if you want to, you know, put one end to uh, the male end of, of whatever and then set the other end to suction, you can do that. Uh, and then you can use a three way catheter as well, uh, which has one male end and two female ends. Um, so in this setup, you can have the level one up top here going into uh, one of the female ends. Uh, this is the wedge method where you have uh, suction hooked up here and then you can have a third third one where, which goes into the line. And then uh, P is for poke. 
Uh, so this is actually a, a pretty novel idea found uh, on YouTube uh, from Georgia Regents Medical Center. Uh, so you have a chest tube going to the patient, but instead of putting a second chest tube to infuse fluids, all I did was take an IV, uh, clean, out the t clean off the tube, and top, insert the IV, an 18 gauge or 16 gauge into the chest tube, and then infuse the fluid through that way. Um, obviously when you're infusing, you want to just lock it off. Um, but this way this, it's not a, you're not creating another hole and it's uh, a lot less messy. Uh, so for our patient, uh, in terms of their, uh, course, they were sent up to the MICU, um, the, they were found to be attended on high flow sats in the eighties. They were intubated and they were started on, uh, leave a fed and vasopressin, uh, by hospital A1, she got a TTE, which showed a possible IBC thrombus, uh, started on heparin. At this point, her utox and her infectious uh, workup was negative. Hospital A3, she was extubated, but then reintubated, likely due to aspiration. Her DVT study was negative. And hospital A4, uh, finally her Solex was removed from her left fem. Hospital A5, uh, she had a CTA PE and uh, abdomen done, which showed a right side of PE, uh, as well as DVT in the left fem external iliac vein, which was at the location of uh, the Solex catheter. Uh, hospital A7, she was successfully extubated, and then uh, eight, she was downgraded to medicine, a note of her intermittent delirium. She also had baseline psych disorder. Um, and the hospital at 13, she was A-locked. Uh, these are the rewarming times, uh, temperatures. Um, and just note that from time of arrival to the MICU, her uh, rewarming time was 0.76. Her rewarming rate was 0.76. Uh, so just the takeaways, uh, in terms of your rewarming modalities, uh, basically your go-to is to use the uh, bear hugger uh, or equivalent and warm IV fluids. That's your go-to for stage two, three, and four. For stage three and four with a pulse, uh, you wanna start doing internal uh, warming. So bladder lavage plus the above, or you might start thinking about your peritoneal lavage or dialysis if feasible. Um, at this point, you really wanna consider ECMO. So at our, uh, for our patient, um, she would have been in this category. For a patient in stage three uh, and four without a pulse, though, you wanna do something more invasive. Um, so consider thoracic lavage. Uh, you're starting your CPR already and then call for ECMO transfer. And then for ACLS, you wanna intubate early, do three uh, defibrillation attempts uh, and then do epi after 30 degrees Celsius. And just to go over prevention quickly, um, it's been a rough year for most everyone. Uh, it's probably rougher for a lot of people, uh, a, a certain subset of people. Um, there's a lot of high, there's a lot of employment going around. Uh, people are getting evicted, uh, increased substance abuse, um, domestic violence, child abuse. Uh, and then for our homeless population, it's just been hard to find a place to sleep. Um, you know, their friends and families might not want them over because of COVID. Um, a lot of diners, 24 hour diners, restaurants are closed. Uh, and then the subways have been closed overnight uh, for cleaning. Uh, they just recently decreased the, the amount of time they clean by two hours, but it's still closed. And I guess, I didn't know this, but last April they had a, a new rule that prohibits people from staying in the subway past, um, or you, you can't stay in the subway for more than an hour. Uh, and you can't stay in the subway stations uh, after the trains have been taken out of service. They also banned carts that are greater than 30 inches long or wide. Um, so a lot of folks aren't even going in the subway systems. I uh, just want to mention uh, code blue. Um, this is a citywide emergency notice that's called uh, when they suspect the temperature is going to drop below 32 degrees Fahrenheit between 4 p.m. and 8 a.m. Uh, during this time, no one is denied from a shelter. Uh, everyone that's referred should be able to go. 
They also have these drop-in centers, which I didn't know about. They're open for 24 hours um, and they essentially assist uh, the homeless, whether it's cold blue or not. And there you can get hot meals, uh, clothing, showers, counselors. Uh, and you're not, it's not really a shelter where you can sleep on a bed, but they do have chairs and they allow you to sleep there. Uh, and they're located all throughout the city. Um, and during Code Blue, they just send more staff out to basically refer patients to uh, the shelters. Just from the articles I read, a lot of people don't want to go to the shelters. Uh, it's dangerous there. People get uh, assaulted. They get things stolen. Uh, I've had plenty of patients tell me they don't want to go as well. Um, so it's just something to consider. If you do want to refer somebody, you can call 311, or this is the direct number to the Department of Homeless Services. Uh, and this is their command center. And then what you can do, uh, provide food and water. You want to make sure they have enough uh, caloric capacity to actually create heat. Ask the patient uh, if they need help, talk to them. Ask them if they have a safe place to go or a warm place to go. Uh, involve source work. Um, you, they can provide clothing, uh, although there are no shoes available. That's still a, a sticking point, a sticky point for us. Uh, just a couple of days ago, I asked social work and they said they weren't providing clothing. It's not their job. Um, you can hand out heat packs. Uh, this ro really won't do much for the core temperature, but just provides uh, some kind of something to prevent uh, other, other cold injuries like frostbite. And then you can always delay discharge and keep them in the And uh, that's my talk. And that's my new buddy, Hobbs. Yeah, I actually asked uh, the social worker that and she said she's never heard of that. Um, yeah, I got a lot of pushback. Both sides of the street. Okay. You, yeah. can, you can stay in the lobbies overnight. That's good to know. They used to set up a lot of cots too. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, initially I thought that you could stay on a heated bus, but yeah, they, they take them to shelters. So you might get a lot of, the bus is heated too. Yeah. Um, I've heard a lot of pushback from that too. People just, and they, when they hear the bus, they're all for it. But then when they want to go to shelters, they're like, no, I don't want to go to shelter. So, but, but it definitely is an option. Yeah. Hey, I'm glad you uh, debunked uh, some of the, the rumors and in particular, like don't all women worry about the intubation is really should be a mainstay. We talk about central line to be very proficient. Yeah, very proficient intubation, warm humidified um, air is a great way to somebody up as you show so I just don't want people to think that you, know, you can't really intubate you absolutely sure. Dr. G. First boy, that was such a great talk as far as really going over everything very well. I mean you put a lot a lot of effort into that. I'm very impressed. The second thing is like you mentioned you don't want to overdo your interventions. Things like as long as they have a a, a detectable pulse, or at least they, you know, are in in B fib or B tac at that very low temperature. Uh, if you start doing things like central lines, that have been shown to increase B fib uh, and death, and giving them medications. I mean, I think to some extent, a slow pulse in the blood, low blood pressure is almost like hibernation. I think it almost even protects them definitely something you see. And if you start trying to treat that like you would with someone who's normal sermon, you give them vasopressors and stuff, you know, even if you may cause more damage, because as you mentioned, as you warm them, when they're very cold, that medicine really doesn't get do anything. It doesn't really, you know, affect the heart or the tissue. And then as you warm them, all that medicine you gave can suddenly come in, you know, as you reach 88, 90 degrees. And it may then actually cause arrhythmia. 
And I've seen that if you get to 88 or 90, they may, that's the time they may go and refib on you on their own if they have all this medicine on board. So I, I question trying to raise that blood pressure with things like dopamine, even if there's a dog study. I remember years ago. Swine and sheep, sorry. It's swine yeah. and sheep. Yeah. I, and sheep, okay. And I just remember. Yeah, watch yeah. it, watch it. Gee. But they're, they're all woolly, you know, and they have other things going on. But, uh, you know, woolly, woolly, with an S behind that. But um, you just got to be very careful, I think, of doing extra stuff unless they're in arrest. And even when they're arrest, like you said, when they're very low, you're not even giving them epi, you're just shocking them and giving them CPR. And if that doesn't work, just giving them the CPR. So I would just caution about using pressors and other medications. I remember one time a lot of people would use atropine because they were so great at clotting. And then nothing would happen. And then when they got warmed up, suddenly they'd go into tacky dysrhythmias because all that stuff came in. So just be careful with that. It was a great call. Really, great call. Really call. Uh, one thing the team did do was uh, to prevent uh, central line induced uh, VFib. Uh, there's some suggestions of just uh, instead of doing in the IJs, just doing the FEMS, and that's what they did in Solex. So you don't agitate the heart. Theoretical, but. Right, thanks, Henry. Great job.